Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter 19 Henry Wimbush Long Cigar burned aromatically. The history of Chrome lay on his knee. Slowly he turned over the pages. I can't decide what episode to read to you tonight, he said thoughtfully. Sir Ferdinando's voyages are not without interest. Then, of course, there's his son, Sir Julius. It was he who suffered from the delusion that his perspiration engendered flies. It drove him finally to suicide. Or there's Sir Cyprian. He turned the pages more rapidly. Or Sir Henry or Sir George. No, I'm inclined to think that I won't read about any of these. "'But you must read something,' insisted Mr. Scogan, taking his pipe out of his mouth. "'I think I shall read about my grandfather,' said Henry Wimbush, "'and the events that led up to his marriage with the eldest daughter of the last Sir Ferdinando.' "'Good,' said Mr. Scogan. "'We're listening.' "'Before I begin reading,' said Henry Wimbush, looking up from the book and taking off the pince-nez which he had just fitted to his nose, "'before we begin,' I must say a few preliminary words about Sir Ferdinando, the last of the Lapiths. At the death of the virtuous and unfortunate Sir Hercules, Ferdinando found himself in possession of the family fortune, not a little increased by his father's temperance and thrift. He applied himself forthwith to the task of spending it, which he did in an ample and jovial fashion. By the time he was forty he had eaten and above all drunk and loved away about half his capital and would infallibly have soon got rid of the rest in the same manner, if he had not had the good fortune to become so madly enamoured of the rector's daughter as to make a proposal of marriage. The young lady accepted him, and, in less than a year, had become the absolute mistress of Crome and her husband. An extraordinary reformation made itself apparent in Sir Ferdinando's character. He grew regular and economical in his habits. He even became temperate, rarely drinking more than a bottle and a half of porter to sitting. The waning fortune of the Lapiths began once more to wax, and that in despite of the hard times, for Sir Ferdinando married in 1809, in the height of the Napoleonic Wars. A prosperous and dignified old age, cheered by the spectacle of his children's growth and happiness, for Lady Lapith had already borne him three daughters, and there seemed no good reason why she should not bear many more of them, and sons as well, a patriarchal decline into the family vault seemed now to be Sir Ferdinando's enviable destiny. But Providence willed otherwise. To Napoleon, cause already of such infinite mischief, was due, though perhaps indirectly, the untimely and violent death which put a period to this reformed existence. Sir Ferdinando, who was above all things a patriot, had adopted from the earliest days of the conflict with the French his own peculiar method of celebrating our victories. When the happy news reached London, it was his custom to purchase immediately a large store of liquor, and, taking a place on whichever of the outgoing coaches he happened to light upon first, to drive through the country, proclaiming the good news to all he met on the road, and dispensing it, along with the liquor, at every stopping place to all who cared to listen or drink. Thus, after the Nile, he had driven as far as Edinburgh and later, when the coaches, wreathed with laurel for triumph, with cypress for mourning, were setting out with the news of Nelson's victory and death, he sat through all a chilly October night on the box of the Norwich Meteor, with a nautical keg of rum on his knees and two cases of old brandy under the seat. This genial custom was one of the many habits which he abandoned on his marriage. The victories in the peninsula, the retreat from Moscow, Leipzig, and the abdication of the tyrant all went uncelebrated. It so happened, however, that in the summer of 1815, Sir Ferdinando was staying for a few weeks in the capital. There had been a succession of anxious, doubtful days. Then came the glorious news of Waterloo. It was too much for Sir Ferdinando. His joyous youth awoke again within him. He hurried to his wine merchant and bought a dozen bottles of 1760 brandy. The bath coach was on the point of starting. He bribed his way onto the box and, seated in glory beside the driver, proclaimed aloud the downfall of the Corsican bandit and passed about the warm, liquid joy. They clattered through Uxbridge, Slough, Maidenhead. Sleeping Reading was awakened by the great news. 
At Didcot, one of the ostlers was so much overcome by patriotic emotions and the 1760 brandy that he found it impossible to do up the buckles of the harness. The night began to grow chilly, and Sir Ferdinando found that it was not enough to take a nip at every stage. To keep up his vital warmth, he was compelled to drink between the stages as well. They were approaching Swindon. The coach was travelling at a dizzy speed, six miles in the last half an hour, when, without having manifested the slightest premonitory symptoms of unsteadiness, Sir Ferdinando suddenly toppled sideways off his seat and fell head foremost into the road. An unpleasant jolt awakened the slumbering passengers. The coach was brought to a standstill. The guard ran back with a light. He found Sir Ferdinando still alive, but unconscious. Blood was oozing from his mouth. The back wheels of the coach had passed over his body, breaking most of his ribs and both arms. His skull was fractured in two places. They picked him up, but he was dead before they reached the next stage. So perished Sir Ferdinando, a victim of his own patriotism. Lady Lapith did not marry again, but determined to devote the rest of her life to the well-being of her three children, Georgiana, now five years old, and Emmeline and Caroline, twins of two. Henry Wimbush paused, and once more put on his pince-nez. "'So much by way of introduction,' he said. "'Now I can begin to read about my grandfather.' "'One moment,' said Mr. Scogan, "'till I've refilled my pipe.' Mr. Wimbush waited. Seated apart in a corner of the room, Ivor was showing Mary his sketches of spirit life. They spoke together in whispers. Mr. Scogan had lighted his pipe again. "'Fire away,' he said. Henry Wimbush fired away. It was in the spring of 1833 that my grandfather, George Wimbush, first made acquaintance of the three lovely Lapiths, as they were always called. He was then a young man of twenty-two with curly yellow hair and a smooth pink face that was the mirror of his youthful and ingenuous mind. He had been educated at Harrow and Christchurch. He enjoyed hunting and all other field sports, and, though his circumstances were comfortable to the verge of affluence, his pleasures were temperate and innocent. His father, an East Indian merchant, had destined him for a political career and had gone to considerable expense in acquiring a pleasant little Cornish borough as a twenty-first birthday gift for his son. He was justly indignant when, on the very eve of George's majority, the Reform Bill of 1832 swept the borough out of existence. The inauguration of George's political career had to be postponed. At the time he got to know the lovely Lapiths, he was waiting. He was not at all impatient. The lovely Lapiths did not fail to impress him. Georgiana, the eldest, with her black ringlets, her flashing eyes, her noble aquiline profile, her swan-like neck and sloping shoulders, was orientally dazzling. And the twins, with their delicately turned-up noses, their blue eyes and chestnut hair, were an identical pair of ravishingly English charmers. Their conversation at this first meeting proved, however, to be so forbidding that, but for the invincible attraction exercised by their beauty, George would never have had the courage to follow up the acquaintance. The twins, looking up their noses at him with an air of languid superiority, asked him what he thought of the latest French poetry, and whether he liked the Indiana of Georges Chand. But what was almost worse was the question with which Georgiana opened her conversation with him. "'In music,' she asked, leaning forward and fixing him with her large, dark eyes, "'are you a classicist or a transcendentalist?' George did not lose his presence of mind. He had enough appreciation of music to know that he hated anything classical. And so, with a promptitude which did him credit, he replied, "'I'm a transcendentalist.' Georgiana smiled bewitchingly. "'I am glad,' she said. "'So am I. "'You went to hear the Paganini last week, of course.' The prayer of Moses. Ah, she closed her eyes. Do you know anything more transcendental than that? No, said George, I don't. He hesitated, was about to go on speaking, and then decided that after all it would be wiser not to say, what was in fact true, that he had enjoyed above all Paganini's farmyard impressions. The man had made his fiddle bray like an ass, cluck like a hen, grunt, squeal, bark, neigh, quack, bellow and growl. 
that last item, in George's estimation, had almost compensated for the tediousness of the rest of the concert. He smiled with pleasure at the thought of it. Yes, decidedly, he was no classicist in music. He was a thoroughgoing transcendentalist. George followed up this first introduction by paying a call on the young ladies and their mother, who occupied during the season a small but elegant house in the neighbourhood of Berkeley Square. Lady Lapith made a few discreet inquiries, and, having found that George's financial position, character and family were all passably good, she asked him to dine. She hoped and expected that her daughters would all marry into the peerage, but, being a prudent woman, she knew it was advisable to prepare for all contingencies. George Wimbush, she thought, would make an excellent second string for one of the twins. At this first dinner, George's partner was Emmeline. They talked of nature. Emmeline protested that to her high mountains were a feeling, and the hum of human cities torture. George agreed that the country was very agreeable, but held that London during the season also had its charms. He noticed with surprise and a certain solicitous distress that Miss Emmeline's appetite was poor, that it didn't, in fact, exist. Two spoonfuls of soup, a morsel of fish, no bird, no meat, and three grapes. That was her whole dinner. He looked from time to time at her two sisters. Georgiana and Caroline seemed to be quite as abstemious. They waved away whatever was offered them with an expression of delicate disgust, shutting their eyes and diverting their faces from the proffered dish, as though the lemon sole, the duck, the loin of veal, the trifle, were objects revolting to the sight and smell. George, who thought the dinner capital, ventured to comment on the sisters' lack of appetite. "'Pray don't talk to me of eating,' said Emmeline, drooping like a sensitive plant. We find it so coarse, so unspiritual, my sisters and I. One can't think of one's soul while one is eating. George agreed one couldn't, but one must live, he said. Alas, Emmeline sighed, one must. Death is very beautiful, don't you think? She broke a corner off a piece of toast and began to nibble at it languidly. But since, as you say, one must live, she made a little gesture of resignation. Luckily, a very little suffices to keep one alive. She put down her corner of toast, half eaten. George regarded her with some surprise. She was pale, but she looked extraordinarily healthy, he thought. So did her sisters. Perhaps if you were really spiritual, you needed less food. He clearly was not spiritual. After this he saw them frequently. They all liked him, from Lady Lapith downwards. True, he was not very romantic or poetical, but he was such a pleasant, unpretentious, kind-hearted young man that one couldn't help liking him. For his part, he thought them wonderful, wonderful, especially Georgiana. He enveloped them all in a warm, protective affection. For they needed protection. They were altogether too frail, too spiritual for this world. They never ate. They were always pale. They often complained of fever. They talked much and lovingly of death. They frequently swooned. Georgiana was the most ethereal of all. Of the three she ate least, swooned most often, talked most of death, and was the palest, with a pallor that was so startling as to appear positively artificial. At any moment, it seemed, she might lose her precarious hold on this material world and become all spirit. To George, the thought was a continual agony, if she were to die. She contrived, however, to live through the season, and that in spite of the numerous balls, routs, and other parties of pleasure which, in company with the rest of the lovely trio, she never failed to attend. In the middle of July, the whole household moved down to the country. George was invited to spend the month of August at Crome. The house party was distinguished. In the list of visitors figured the names of two marriageable young men of title. George had hoped that the country air, repose, and natural surroundings might have restored to the three sisters their appetites and the rose of their cheeks. He was mistaken. For dinner the first evening Georgiana ate only an olive, two or three salted almonds, and half a peach. She was as pale as ever. During the meal she spoke of love. True love, she said, being infinite and eternal, 
can only be consummated in eternity. Indiana and Sir Rodolph celebrated the mystic wedding of their souls by jumping into Niagara. Love is incompatible with life. The wish of two people who truly love one another is not to live together, but to die together. Come, come, my dear, said Lady Lapith, stout and practical. What would become of the next generation, pray, if all the world acted on your principles? Mamma, Georgiana protested, and dropped her eyes. In my young days, Lady Lapith went on, I should have been laughed out of countenance if I'd said a thing like that. But then, in my young days, souls weren't as fashionable as they are now, and we didn't think death was at all poetical. It was just unpleasant. Mamma, Emmeline and Caroline implored in unison. In my young days, Lady Lapith was launched into her subject. Nothing, it seemed, could stop her now. In my young days, if you didn't eat, people told you you needed a dose of rhubarb. Nowadays, there was a cry. Georgiana had swooned sideways on to Lord Timpany's shoulder. It was a desperate expedient, but it was successful. Lady Lapith was stopped. The days passed in an uneventful round of pleasures. Of all the gay party, George alone was unhappy. Lord Timpany was paying his court to Georgiana, and it was clear that he was not unfavourably received. George looked on, and his soul was a hell of jealousy and despair. The boisterous company of the young men became intolerable to him. He shrank from them, seeking gloom and solitude. One morning, having broken away from them on some vague pretext, he returned to the house alone. The young men were bathing in the pool below. Their cries and laughter floated up to him, making the quiet house seem lonelier and more silent. The lovely sisters and their mamma still kept their chambers. They did not customarily make their appearance till luncheon, so that the male guests had the morning to themselves. George sat down in the hall and abandoned himself to thought. At any moment she might die. At any moment she might become Lady Timpany. It was terrible, terrible. If she died, then he would die too. He would go to seek her beyond the grave. If she became Lady Timpany, ah, then, the solution of the problem would not be so simple. If she became Lady Timpany, it was a horrible thought. But then suppose she were in love with Timpany, though it seemed incredible that anyone could be in love with Timpany. Suppose her life depended on Timpany. Suppose she couldn't live without him. He was fumbling his way along this clueless labyrinth of suppositions when the clock struck twelve. On the last stroke, like an automaton released by the turning clockwork, a little maid holding a large covered tray popped out of the door that led from the kitchen regions into the hall. From his deep arm chair, George watched her, himself it was evident unobserved, with an idle curiosity. She pattered across the room and came to a halt in front of what seemed a blank expanse of panelling. She reached out her hand and, to George's extreme astonishment, a little door swung open, revealing the foot of a winding staircase. Turning sideways in order to get her tray through the narrow opening, the little maid darted in with a rapid, crab-like motion. The door closed behind her with a click. A minute later it opened again, and the maid, without her tray, hurried back across the hall and disappeared in the direction of the kitchen. George tried to recompose his thoughts, but an invincible curiosity drew his mind towards the hidden door, the staircase the little maid. It was in vain, he told himself, that the matter was none of his business, that to explore the secrets of that surprising door, that mysterious staircase within, would be a piece of unforgivable rudeness and indiscretion. It was in vain. For five minutes he struggled heroically with this curiosity, but at the end of that time he found himself standing in front of the innocent sheet of panelling through which the little maid had disappeared. A glance sufficed to show him the position of the secret door, Secret he perceived only to those who looked with a careless eye. It was just an ordinary door let in flush with the panelling. No latch nor handle betrayed its position, but an unobtrusive catch sunk in the wood invited the thumb. George was astonished that he had not noticed it before. Now he had seen it, it was so obvious, almost as obvious as the cupboard door in the library with its lines of imitation shelves and its dummy books. He pulled back the catch and peeped inside. 
the staircase of which the degrees were made not of stone but of blocks of ancient oak, wound up and out of sight. A slit-like window admitted the daylight. He was at the foot of the central tower, and the little window looked out over the terrace. They were still shouting and splashing in the pool below. George closed the door and went back to his seat. But his curiosity was not satisfied. Indeed, this partial satisfaction had but whetted his appetite. Where did the staircase lead? What was the errand of the little maid? It was no business of his, he kept repeating, no business of his. He tried to read, but his attention wandered. A quarter past twelve sounded on the harmonious clock. Suddenly determined, George rose, crossed the room, opened the hidden door, and began to ascend the stairs. He passed the first window, corkscrewed round, and came to another. He paused for a moment to look out. His heart beat uncomfortably, as though he were affronting some unknown danger. What he was doing, he told himself, was extremely ungentlemanly, horribly underbred. He tiptoed onward and upward. One more turn, then half a turn, and a door confronted him. He halted now before it, listened, he could hear no sound. Putting his eye to the keyhole, he saw nothing but a stretch of white sunlit wall. Emboldened, he turned the handle and stepped across the threshold. There he halted, petrified by what he saw, mutely gaping. In the middle of a pleasantly sunny little room, it is now Priscilla's boudoir, Mr. Wimbush remarked parenthetically, stood a small circular table of mahogany, crystal, porcelain, and silver, all the shining apparatus of an elegant meal, were mirrored in its polished depths. The carcass of a cold chicken, a bowl of fruit, a great ham deeply gashed to its heart of tenderest white and pink, the brown cannonball of a cold plum pudding, a slender hot bottle, and a decanter of claret, jostled one another for a place on this festive board. And round the table sat the three sisters, the three lovely lapiths eating. At George's sudden entrance they had all looked towards the door, and now they sat petrified by the same astonishment which kept George fixed and staring. Georgiana, who sat immediately facing the door, gazed at him with dark, enormous eyes. Between the thumb and forefinger of her right hand she was holding a drumstick of the dismembered chicken. Her little finger, elegantly crooked, stood apart from the rest of her hand. Her mouth was open, but the drumstick had never reached its destination. It remained suspended, frozen, in mid-air. The other two sisters had turned round to look at the intruder. Caroline still grasped her knife and fork. Emmeline's fingers were round the stem of her claret glass. For what seemed a very long time, George and the three sisters stared at one another in silence. They were a group of statues. Then, suddenly, there was movement. Georgiana dropped her chicken bone. Caroline's knife and fork clattered on her plate. The movement propagated itself, grew more decisive. Emmeline sprang to her feet, uttering a cry. The wave of panic reached George. He turned and, mumbling something unintelligible as he went, rushed out of the room and down the winding stairs. He came to a standstill in the hall, and there, all by himself in the quiet house, he began to laugh. At luncheon it was noticed that the sisters ate a little more than usual. Georgiana toyed with some French beans and a spoonful of calf's foot jelly. "'I feel a little stronger today,' she said to Lord Timpany, when he congratulated her on this increase of appetite. "'A little more material,' she added with a nervous laugh. Looking up, she caught George's eye. A blush suffused her cheeks, and she looked hastily away. In the garden that afternoon they found themselves for a moment alone. "'You won't tell anyone, George. Promise you won't tell anyone,' she implored. "'It would make us look so ridiculous. And besides, eating is unspiritual, isn't it? Say you won't tell anyone.' "'I will,' said George brutally. "'I'll tell everyone, unless—' "'It's blackmail.' "'I don't care,' said George. "'I'll give you twenty-four hours to decide.' Lady Lapith was disappointed, of course. She had hoped for better things, for timpani and a coronet. But George, after all, wasn't so bad.' They were married at the new year. My poor grandfather, Mr. Wimbush added, as he closed his book and put away his pince-nez, 
Whenever I read in the papers about oppressed nationalities, I think of him. He relighted his cigar. It was a maternal government, highly centralised, and there were no representative institutions. Henry Wimbush ceased speaking. In the silence that ensued, Ivor's whispered commentary on the spirit sketches once more became audible. Priscilla, who had been dozing, suddenly woke up. What? she said in startled tones of one newly returned to consciousness. What? Jenny caught the words. She looked up, smiled, nodded reassuringly. It's about a ham, she said. What's about a ham? What Henry's been reading? She closed the red notebook lying on her knees and slipped a rubber band round it. I'm going to bed, she announced, and got up. So am I, said Anne, yawning. But she lacked the energy to rise from her armchair. The night was hot and oppressive. Round the open windows the curtains hung unmoving. Ivor, fanning himself with a portrait of an astral being, looked out into the darkness and drew a breath. The air's like wool, he declared. It will get cooler after midnight, said Henry Wimbush, and cautiously added, perhaps. I shan't sleep, I know. Priscilla turned her head in his direction. The monumental coiffure nodded exorbitantly at her slightest movement. You must make an effort, she said. When I can't sleep, I concentrate my will. I say, I will sleep, I am asleep, and pop, off I go. That's the power of thought. But does it work on stuffy nights? Ivor inquired. I simply cannot sleep on a stuffy night. Nor can I, said Mary, except out of doors. Out of doors? What a wonderful idea! In the end, they decided to sleep on the towers. Mary on the western tower, Ivor on the eastern. There was a flat expanse of leads on each of the towers, and you could get a mattress through the trap doors that opened onto them. Under the stars, under the gibbous moon, assuredly they would sleep. The mattresses were hauled up, sheets and blankets were spread, and an hour later the two insomniasts, each on his separate tower, were crying their good nights across the dividing gulf. On Mary the sleep-compelling charm of the open air did not work with its expected magic. Even through the mattress one could not fail to be aware that the leads were extremely hard. Then there were noises, the owls screeched tirelessly, and once, roused by some unknown terror, all the geese of the farmyard burst into a sudden frenzy of cackling. The stars and the gibbous moon demanded to be looked at, and when one meteorite had streaked across the sky, you could not help waiting, open-eyed and alert, for the next. Time passed. The moon climbed higher and higher in the sky. Mary felt less sleepy than she had when she first came out. She sat up and looked over the parapet. Had Ivor been able to sleep, she wondered? And, as though in answer to her mental question, from behind the chimney-stack, at the farther end of the roof, a white form noiselessly emerged, a form that, in the moonlight, was recognisably Ivor's. Spreading his arms to right and left like a tightrope dancer, he began to walk forward along the roof-tree of the house. He swayed terrifyingly as he advanced. Mary looked on speechlessly. Perhaps he was walking in his sleep. Suppose he were to wake up suddenly now. If she spoke or moved, it might mean his death. She dared look no more, but sank back into her pillows. She listened intently. For what seemed an immensely long time, there was no sound. Then there was a patter of feet on the tiles, followed by a scrabbling noise and a whispered, Damn! And suddenly Ivor's head and shoulders appeared above the parapet. One leg followed, and then the other. He was on the leads. Mary pretended to wake up with a start. Oh, she said, what are you doing here? I couldn't sleep, he explained, and so I came along to see if you couldn't. One gets bored by oneself on a tower. Don't you find it so? It was light before five. Long, narrow clouds barred the east, their edges bright with orange fire. The sky was pale and watery. With a mournful scream of a soul in pain, a monstrous peacock flying heavily up from below alighted on the parapet of the tower. Ivor and Mary started broad awake. "'Catch him!' cried Ivor, jumping up. "'We'll have a feather.' The frightened peacock ran up and down the parapet in an absurd distress, curtsying and bobbing and clucking. His long tail swung ponderously back and forth as he turned and turned again. Then, with a flap and a swish, he launched himself upon the air and sailed magnificently earthward, 
with a recovered dignity. But he had left a trophy. Ivor had his feather, a long lashed eye of purple and green, of blue and gold. He handed it to his companion. An angel's feather, he said. Mary looked at it for a moment, gravely and intently. Her purple pyjamas clothed her with an ampleness that hid the lines of her body. She looked like some large, comfortable, unjointed toy, a sort of teddy bear, but a teddy bear with an angel's head, pink cheeks, and hair like a bell of gold. An angel's face, the feather of an angel's wing, somehow the whole atmosphere of this sunrise was rather angelic. "'It's extraordinary to think of sexual selection,' she said at last, looking up from her contemplation of the miraculous feather. "'Extraordinary,' Ivor echoed. "'I select you, you select me. What luck!' He put his arm around her shoulder, and they stood looking eastward. The first sunlight had begun to warm and colour the pale light of the dawn. Mauve pyjamas and white pyjamas, they were a young and charming couple. The rising sun touched their faces. It was all extremely symbolic. But then, if you chose to think so, nothing in this world is not symbolical. Profound and beautiful truth. "'I must be getting back to my tower,' said Ivor at last. "'Already?' "'I'm afraid so. The varletry will soon be up and about. Ivor, there was a prolonged and silent farewell. "'And now,' said Ivor, "'I repeat my tightrope stunt.' Mary threw her arms round his neck. "'You mustn't, Ivor. It's dangerous. Please.' He had to yield at last to her entreaties. "'All right,' he said. "'I'll go down through the house and up at the other end.' He vanished through the trap-door into the darkness that still lurked within the shuttered house. A minute later, he had reappeared on the farther tower. He waved his hand, and then sank down out of sight behind the parapet. From below, in the house, came the thin, wasp-like buzzing of an alarm clock. He had gone back just in time. End of chapter